uh, the webinar. Uh, it's a pleasure to invite you all to the expert talk on uh, Fire and HL7 working together. Our speaker today is John Murky. John Murky is a member of Fire Management Group. He is also the co-chair of HL7 Secret Security Workgroup and a Fire Core Team member. He is co-chair of I IHE IT Infrastructure Technical Co and Planning Committee. In the past, he was a core member of direct project specification, uh, writing, authoring the security section and supporting the risk assessment. He is active in many regional initiatives such as SNI Framework, Smart Heart, Commonwealth, Care Quality, Sequoia, and uh, Vision. John is in healthcare standardization since 1999, during which time he has authored various standards and profiles and white papers. His blog is one of the most authentic source of information on healthcare standards, security, and privacy. And uh, you have the blog link will be shared in the chat. You can go through it. So welcome, John. Uh, welcome. Thank you for accepting our invite to uh, for the talk today. Over to you, John. Good evening. Yeah, uh, I, I really appreciate the uh, opportunity to talk to you. Um, I uh, find it interesting that my current uh, job is the first job in my professional career that I didn't have a uh, software development team in uh, India. So from uh, back in the in the late eight, 1980s uh, through um, a few years ago, I've I've always had a development team associated with my work, uh, you know, somewhere within uh, India. So uh, what I'm going to go through today is is a slide deck that that I've actually started uh, quite a few years ago um, at uh, uh, one of the dev days. And um, slide is not advanced. There we go. Um, so actually, it was the uh, 2017 Dev Days that I originally uh, uh, developed this. So I, I just keep that that picture around. Um, so what I'm going to go through is is you know the understanding of of what IHE is, what its role is in in the interoperability space. Uh, how that contrasts with HL7, how it is similar with HL7. Um, then I'm, I'm going to go through uh, some various uh, uh, explanations of how IHG functions its its governance and development process, and then uh, covering the differences and the similarities between IHG Connectathon and Fire Connectathon. So um, really, when, it, when you look at the vision statement that comes out of HL7 and the vision statement that comes out of IHE, and, and those uh, are on the screen, um, I, I have to uh, confess, I did not check to see if anybody has uh, modified their vision uh, statements, um, but I'm pretty sure these are similar or are, are, are what they, they, they were. Or, um, and if you look at them, you can see that they are both explaining that their their vision is rather similar. Um, the HL7 is is speaking to getting the right health data, uh, you know, where it is needed, and uh, IHE is is you know, explaining how it is enabling seamless and secure access. So uh, you know that they're, they're really very similar, but there there is a, a slight complement there. The mission statements are also uh, similarly rather um, uh, similar. HL7 uh, providing standards that empower global health and data interoperability. IHE to improve healthcare uh, by providing specifications, tools, and services. Um, so. These are the, the 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 vision and the mission statements, and you can see that these two organizations um, uh, are are similar, but they have a complement, and I'll explain some of those um, as we go on. So, 
Um, Aichi, uh, integrating the healthcare enterprise, is comprised of a set of, of domains and technical uh, um, domains which, which have technical and planning committees. Um, uh, there is a, a set of uh, work groups and steering committees over in HL7 as a similar uh, organizational structure. Um, in IHE, there is a conformity assessment process and tools. Um, over in HL7, there are conformance statements uh, for HL7 standards like CDA and, and the like. Um, IHE uh, meets typically three times a year, um, and, and uh, HL7 also meets uh, three times a year. Um, IHE is starting to meet four times a year, um, and you know, with the the virtual meetings that we're having nowadays, it's kind of hard to necessarily uh, count them. Um, as much as we used to be able to. So IG uh, is, is really there to coordinate standards. And you'll see that IG is coordinating standards, not just HL7, but DICOM and W3C and IETF and OASIS. So IG is a coordinating body of many standards, whereas HL7 does have some work groups that are overlay overlapping. So there is a imaging uh, work group over in HL7, but that's predominantly a, a very one-to-one uh, -one, um, coordination of standards activities. And then there's also uh, a, a set of national deployment committees uh, within IG and over in HL7, they call them affiliates. So. Um, you know, this, these are, are both international uh, standards bodies that have regional um, uh, you know, committees that uh, help guide the organizations. Um, both of them conduct some kind of testing, some kind of education, some kind of outreach, some kind of collaboration. Um, there is different intensities in all of those. So you'll note that HL7 tends to have a far more visible education track than IG has, but IG has a much more visible testing track. We'll get into that. So IG um, has a development process, which is uh, uh, roughly speaking uh, around a a one-year annual cycle. Um, there are a call for proposals um, that you see down in the very uh, lower left-hand column where we start. Um, those go through a process of evaluating um, as to whether they are clear, whether there is a consensus that this is a need. Um, and then we go through a process of, of standard selection to develop uh, a, a supplement. Those are published for public comment. Comments are resolved. We publish for trial implementation. And um, all of this up till this point um, uh, usually is uh, you know, somewhere between four and, and 14 months uh, cycle. Um, usually then there is this, this phase that is the trial implementation phase where uh, testing goes on, uh, adjustments are made to the trial implementation supplements, um, and, and uh, during that there is various connectathons, there is various uh, showcases, um, and at some point, a, there's an evaluation done by the committees that a supplement, a profile, uh, has reached maturity. It has proven that there have been at least three independently developed solutions that followed that profile and have proven interoperability. There are test tools. There are no open uh, change requests and uh, a set of, of maturity evaluations, and then it transitions into final text. 
And this has been going on since, you know, 1998. So IHE has been around for uh, a while. HL7 um, is an ANSI accredited standards uh, development organization. Um, IHE is a, uh, a recognized standards um, uh, affiliate of, of class D. Within HL7, um, there is also new projects come in. Um, they are evaluated, specifications are developed. There is potentially some uh, STU connectathon testing. And this here is, is really where the fire connectathon um, uh, shines the most. Um, and I'll, I'll touch upon that again uh, later, but essentially this fire connectathon um, uh, tends to focus around this, this specification development and STU uh, initial testing. Um, it then goes out to ballot. Um, uh, ballot resolution happens and we get to a publication. Um, that may uh, go through the cycle more than one times through, through a couple of uh, STUs. Um, and then uh, eventually, again, there's a set of maturity uh, marks that a, a specification needs to meet before it becomes a, uh, a, a normative standard. So there is a very similar process. Um, they, of course, uh, lay them out uh, in different graphics, but essentially they go through a similar step of proposal, specification writing, uh, balloting, uh, maturing at, at an STU level until it moves uh, to a normative level. So um, this is where we start to create a distinction between IG and HL7. Um, IG is, is not a standards organization. If a new work item comes to IG, and we look at the standards that are available and we find that there is no standard available, IHE process uh, uh, puts that particular work item on hold. Um, usually we, we gather together to uh, discuss, well, which standards organization would be best to create the standard that we're going to uh, profile. Uh, and then we, uh, you know, go off and talk to that organization. And that's been one of the relationships that IHE has had with HL7 is when we would come to realize that, uh, you know, there, there wasn't this particular uh, foundational standard for us to develop upon, and yet we have a need that has been brought to us. We need this particular standard developed and off uh, HL7 would uh, develop often with you know, 80% uh, of the same people engaged. And once that standard was available, uh, we would then come back and reinitialize that project in IHE uh, and constrain that standard for the particular use case. And constraining a standard for a particular use case is the role of IHE. So IHE doesn't develop standards, they will constrain standards for a particular use case. Um, and that's the distinction. So a profile is given a use case, a well-defined use case uh, of all possible standards, which one should I use? And for that standard and all of its optionality, how should I get rid of the optionality to satisfy this particular use case? So IHE, has uh, for you know over 20 years called these specifications profiles. Um, HL7 has uh, historically had things called implementation guides. Um, in the past couple of years, implementation guides have become a much broader uh, set of works from HL7. But essentially a profile and an implementation guide are essentially the same thing. It's just what the two different organizations call this concept of taking a use case and constraining the underlying standards. 
So one of the other differences in this space is that IHE uh, being a, a uh, non-specific uh, standards organization can profile any best uh, choice standard. So if we get a use case and we look at the available standards and we find out that W3C has a better standard than HL7 has to solve a particular problem, IG can choose that and, and continue on writing our profile that uses a W3C standard. HL7, when it writes implementation guides, it, it can't do that. It essentially has to uh, constrain its own standards. So one of the differences uh, you will find is that HL7 implementation guides are only constraining HL7 standards, whereas IHE has profiles that have uh, uh, profiled HL7, V2, uh, V3, CDA, Fire, but also DICOM, also W3C, also OASIS, also IETF. So IHE is a, is a much broader uh, uh, set of standards to choose from and therefore uh, when selecting what is the best standard, um, IHE uh, you know, has that broader set to pull from. So I mentioned Connectathon a couple of times. I know Connectathon was one of the words um, in, in this webinar. So a Connectathon is a cross vendor. So you get a bunch of vendors uh, or, or software developers, solutions uh, architects, if you will. Uh, generally, they are uh, live events. Um, they've been virtual, but they're still you know, live events. They're, they're in real time. Um, supervised, uh, meaning there is somebody who is watching uh, a particular track or a particular profile uh, to see that the, the participants are following the specification versus just wink, wink, nod, nod. Yeah, my system just talked to yours, didn't it? Um, and uh, there is some structure to the testing. Um, the participating vendors um, are expected to test usually with some kind of a test tool, and they're uh, uh, usually expected to test with a partner uh, or three partners or four partners. So there's some partner testing. Um, there is usually um, enough of the, the uh, technical committee uh, participation right there um, uh, uh, during the event to help with resolving where, you know, two different vendors uh, say, wait a minute, I read the specification this way. Oh, I read it that way. Uh, who's right? Um, and and usually, you know, uh, whether it's an HL7 Fire Connectathon or an IHE Connectathon, usually some resolution can uh, be, be come to. And when that happens, we see that as a reason to fix the specification. So a, a change request goes in to fix the specification. Um, one of the uh, expectations of Connectathon is to try to get as close to real world scenarios as possible, but in a very um, uh, open, and uh, participative uh, environment. You'll notice the picture there um, is, is a bunch of uh, software developers side by side, shoulder to shoulder. Um, that's not a picture of a one vendor. That's a picture of probably 10 different vendors, um, you know, one or two or three people from each vendor. Um, each of them are, are, are you know, uh, usually uh, organized by the, the, the profiles they're testing. Um, and, you know, we try to, to make this as real world as possible. Um, one of the rules of Connectathon um, is that it's okay to talk about your successes, um, but you are forbidden to talk about the failures of others. So, uh, you know, this, this rule allows us to 
um, a have people talk very openly and try things that they may not yet be ready to try so that they can learn so connectathons are learning events but um, the rules of engagement are you cannot speak ill of your competitors um, you can certainly speak well of your competitors but you're not allowed to speak ill of your competitors so how is a connectathon at IHE versus fire um, uh, you know similar or different um, the fire connectathons are much more focused on testing the uh, the specifications uh, testing theories um, prototyping um, you know well how could we solve this if we you know get two systems together and try something out oh yep that doesn't exactly work so a fire connectathon is is really a uh, uh, something that's intended to focus on the stage of a specification prior to going out to ballot um, yeah there is some you know, post ballot uh, testing at a fire connectathon, but generally speaking, the fire connectathons are 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 trying to help uh, bring the specification together. And and um, you know, another word that has historically been used for that kind of an event is a hackathon. Um, uh, it's it's where you're you're hacking your way through the the problem. Whereas a IHE connectathon um, does have a little bit of that. Uh, it doesn't. It's not completely devoid of that. But those are usually very few and far between. A fire connect or an IHE connectathon is is far more a testing event around a specification once it's been through ballot and it's now in trial implementation or final text. The testing. Uh, uh, usually will have a formal test procedure. It usually will have a formal test tool uh, that is that will simulate a, a client or will simulate a server. Uh, and um, a IHE connectathon, uh, there is strict tracking of successes, not failures, but successes. Um, and there is publication um, on the IHE connectathon website of the successes that the vendors have had testing the profiles that they've tested. So there's also a lot of visibility to the successes. Um, and uh, IG Connectathon also does do peer-to-peer -peer testing. So um, I, I'm going to go into a little deeper into the IHG process, but I wanted to see if there was any questions up until this point about um, the uh, similarities or, or, and differences between um, IHG as a body, HL7 as a body, Fire Connectathon, and IHG Connectathon. Thanks, John. Let me see if there are any questions. So far, uh, no questions. So John, I had some questions, uh, if you can help us answer that. Yeah. So you mentioned about the profile, uh, profiling and implementation guides, right? Yeah. And you did mention about the differences between what uh, a fire uh, profile or implementation guide would be versus uh, IHE implementation guide or profile would be, right? Mm -hmm. uh, can you elaborate a little bit more, like when we say fire profile, what does it really mean? Yeah, that actually hits upon a, a dissonance, um, I'll, I'll say. Um, uh, you know, and I'll, I'll, I'm gonna, this is gonna be from my perspective. Unfortunately, the fire community decided to call a structure definition, which is constraining a particular resource they decided to call that thing a profile. And um, that is, is a very, you know, small, uh, you know, thing to be calling a profile. So it's, it, it, 
Um, you will see the word profile in the context of fire. Um, and the word profile in the context of fire is not the same as a profile in the context of IHE. Um, uh, a profile in the context of fire is just one uh, constraint on a resource. To get an implementation guide, you generally have to have a use case, which you then do use case analysis into actors and transactions and content. And uh, it's only at the, the content that you say, uh, this zero to many element is a uh, must. It's a one to many element. That that particular constraint is a, a, a important part of the implementation guide, but the whole implementation guide starts from use case analysis and defines actors and defines uh, uh, interactions between those actors, transactions. Um, and even within a transaction, there is a set of trigger events which are, you know, which are important to a implementation guide or an IHE profile, but you will not see a trigger event in a fire structure definition. In, in structure definition is only, you know, well, what is the constraints of, of the message? So there's that distance. Um, other than that, a IHE profile is very equivalent to an HL7 implementation guide. And indeed, one of the things that IHE is doing uh, uh, right now, one of the things I'm leading is uh, HL7 has developed this implementation guide publication uh, mechanics. Um, and, and you'll see that's what the fire implementation guides, they all look kind of similar. Um, IHE is, is, is looking to use that same tooling uh, because a IHE profile is the same functionality as a HL7 implementation guide. And therefore, um, we, you know, IHE would benefit by using the same tooling. And ultimately, um, uh, as, as each of us learns a better way to explain, um, a, you know, something, uh, we both benefit by using the same tooling. Did that answer your question? Yes, John, uh, thanks. So uh, John, a follow-up question. IHE also has a lot of uh, fire profiles, right? I mean, so IHE profiles on fire, right? Yes, yeah, IHE has, I think 35 um, IHE profiles, implementation guides um, upon fire. Um, I, I don't have them in uh, this slide deck, but uh, they are, there's some pointers to uh, to them at, at the end of the slide deck, um, I can I can show them yeah. when we get, uh, when we get there. But so yes. John, one, yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, so IHE definitely has some profiles that that leverage fire. Um, indeed, mm. um, you know we have some profiles that are are combining uh, standards, other uh, non HL7 standards with fire based standards. Um, so again, leveraging the fact that IG can pull from many standards organizations. Uh, thanks, John. So John, uh, there is one more question uh, uh, that comes from the audience is, uh, is uh, like in the connectathon, is it a technical event? Is it only about testing or uh, can somebody go and learn something and come out even if they don't have a product to test? Ah, yes. Um, there is a, a uh, in, in both the Fire Connectathons and IEG Connectathons, there is usually uh, some way to participate in that you are there to learn and observe and um, uh, help at the at, at the user experience level. Um, mostly the the events, the you know fire connectathon events and IG events, they are designed mostly to do the detailed you know technical interop testing 
but because you have this rich environment, um, uh, often uh, there's an opportunity there, you know, for for you know people who are not technicians but are using the 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 solutions or or uh, wanting to uh, learn about how the solution uh, you know might meet their needs. Um, these are usually a different track through the Connectathon. Oftentimes there is is uh, independent um, uh, study uh, and then uh, uh, tours around to various um, tracks within the Connectathon. But yes, there there certainly is an opportunity there. The caution is that when that level of of a, of a person is engaged in the Connectathon, they also have to abide by, you cannot say any ill of anything that you've seen go bad at Connectathon. You, you, you know, that, that rule has to be uh, uh, true no matter whether you are sitting at a keyboard behind some technology or observing, uh, because otherwise the whole trust uh, and productivity of the Connectathon event falls. But, um, Absolutely, there's there. It's a great opportunity to learn. So one thing that you're underlying again and again, Connectathon is about collaboration, and Connectathon is about connecting, right? So it's okay to fail, uh, and it's uh, but uh, it's about collaboration. Uh, you test with vendors, you test with uh, your uh, competitors, right? The Absolutely. only rule is you don't say ill about them, right? So it's a very good connection building exercise as well and collaboration, right? It, is that the aim of Connectathon also, John, to actually foster uh, data sharing and making sure that the vendors get a place where they come out of their companies and actually they're not competing but collaborating? Yeah, absolutely. And, and indeed, we, we sometimes do use the term, it's okay to fail. Um, because we want people to try. Um, uh, the the Connectathon event is intentionally designed to be, you know, engineer to engineer. Because you know, when you get two engineers, they they uh, together, <laughs> they want to succeed. Uh, they're willing to help their their peer out, they don't see them as a business competitor. Um, so you, you tend to see uh, huge collaboration. I've, I've absolutely seen where uh, fierce competing uh, organizations are sitting side by side trying to figure out why this isn't working. And, and you'll see, if, you know, if you're a monitor, um, you'll notice one guy actually has his source code up. And the other one is helping debug the source code. You know, this is just an unheard of thought, but it's because of this, uh, this environment that we're there uh, to test this stuff in a, in a friendly environment so that when we do get to um, the competitive environment where, you know, the customer has purchased both of our products and uh, says, okay, make them work. Um, and, and you're under the, the microscope, if you will, um, and you don't have the best people, you're, you're dealing with, um, you know, the, the, the people who are available in that region or, or what have you. So, you know, trying to do your first time of integration testing at a customer site with the customer standing over you, and you are are a service technician as opposed to the software developer who wrote the code is not a real happy environment. Whereas you can get that exact same uh, products side by side with the engineer who wrote the code, you'll very quickly um, get the problem resolved. And then that you know won't happen at the customer site. That's the whole purpose of a connect-a-thon. That's why IHE um, uh, rolled out this concept of connected. Thanks, John. So John, uh, should we take a couple of more questions or should we go ahead and uh, complete your deck and then take the questions? It, it's up to you. Um, I, I, 
I certainly have um, more slides to go through, but I want to meet your your needs. And if there's questions, I f I find answering questions oftentimes hits the mark better. But it's up to you. I certainly have slides. Sure, John. So uh, let me ask a couple of more questions that are on the screen. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the question is. Is it possible that HL7 community and IHE may develop different implementation guides for the same use case? Are there guidelines for choosing among the implementation guides from a given use case for a given use case? Yeah, that's actually a um, a problem that is emerging right now. So historically, HL7 didn't write a whole lot of implementation guides and, and the ones that they did tended to be like CDA. CDA was an implementation guide. Um, and IHE would further refine the CDA implementation guide into medical summary or laboratory report. Um, and, and there was a clear, you know, uh, which organization does which. Today, you're starting to see a lot of implementation guides coming out of HL7. Uh, while IHE is still producing implementation guides. So there is right now a risk that the exact same need will be brought by different organizations to IHE and HL7, and, and they may come up with different solutions. Um, there is some uh, organizational cooperation that is being put in place. Um, uh, there's actually a couple of them um, where we are trying to do whatever we can to prevent that from happening. The, um, the informal uh, agreement that we have today is that HL7 is a good place to write an implementation guide purely on HL7 specifications and, and purely on a singular specification. And IG is where you would go where you needed a more complex implementation guide that might have many steps, might need to coordinate many standards, uh, might need to you, uh, include standards outside of the HL7 uh, set. So this is why you're kind of seeing a lot of fire-based implementation guides coming out of uh, HL7, but you don't see any implementation guides that are multi-standard um, coming out of HL7, but you will see them over in IHE. And indeed, uh, one example um, uh, that I can, uh, show is that we have in IHE some document uh, centric implementation guides that, uh, for example, a uh, an ambulance um, uh, report. And we have created a profile for if you want to use CDA, here's the set of constraints. If you want to use a fire document, here's the set of constraints. Um, so IHE can do that very naturally because you know, IG is, is there to coordinate many standards. Um, HL7 uh, hasn't exactly done that. In, in fact, the, the uh, international um, IPS, International Patient Summary, um, they have two different implementation guides, one for CDA, one for uh, fire. And there's actually some incompatibilities between those two implementation guides. So yes, there can be overlap. Um, we are both trying hard not to have it happen. Um, oftentimes the problem can be that uh, a new work item proposal comes to HL7. It's very difficult for HL7 to tell that, you know, that uh, proposing organization yeah, we're not the right organization. Go talk to IHE, um, especially if they're not an IHE knowledgeable organization. Similarly, if someone brings a new work item proposal to IHE and we go, well, this is too simple. 
uh, this should be done over in, in, in HL7, or this is too foundational. Um, if they're not an HL7 member, it's difficult for IHE to say, oh, become an HL7 member so that you can write your specification over there. So there is some membership issues and we're trying to work out some of those. So best I can say is, uh, you know, uh, over the next couple of years, we should see a resolution um, and, and a mechanics for assuring that happens less. But I don't know of any cases yet where it has explicitly happened. And then your, your last part of your question of, well, which one should you choose if you, if you do find that there are two? Um, you know, I, I'm a little biased. I, I'm, I'm just as active in both organizations, but because IHE can um, choose from the world of standards and not just HL7, um, I would tend to believe that IHE has probably done a, a, a more comprehensive uh, specification and didn't just use the hammer that you have in your hand to pound that screw in, which is essentially what HL7 has to do. If, if, if the solution is, is you know, uh, brought to HL7, they have to use an HL7 standard to solve that problem. Thanks, John. So there are uh, like uh, three questions which are kind of same, and they are talking about uh, the success stories of fire implementation and the challenges. And uh, you also have your work with the ONC, right? Uh, how you're coordinating there with the IHE and the fire and other stuff. So can you give us some light on uh, what is the success or challenges of fire implementations that you're seeing in the real world? And the connected question is, how much of them are really tested in uh, connectathons? And uh, how many of them we surface on the, in the field, the problems? Um, yeah, that, that gets to, you know, a, a, a dirty little secret. Um, and, and it's not a secret within the core, uh, the fire core memberships. Um, so, you know, Lloyd and Graham and, and Ewut and, you know, that, that core set of, of, of people involved in the development of FIRE fully recognize that FIRE is an emerging standard, that it is, is it has some things that have reached normative that, that one should be able to look at as ready to deploy. Um, but we fully expect that, uh, you know, we, we've been in this business a long time. Uh, <laughs> uh, we fully expect that at some point, uh, you know, something's going to come up that, oh, shoot, we didn't think about that. Um, so these are our, our bleeding edge standards. Um, that said, uh, there is huge number of years of experience in the the people involved in in writing the fire specification and therefore uh, what you see in the fire specification is is not as green as it you know not as immature as as it may appear um, it, it is based upon decades and decades and really decades of, of, of experience. Um, so I've, I've given both, you know, positive and negative statements there. Uh, real world deployments of fire have been extremely focused and um, very dominantly around uh, just simply observation. And within observation, a small set of vital signs. And in that space, there's not a whole lot of, of, of uh, uh, immaturity left. They're pretty mature spaces. That said, you know, um, we, we, we see every day where, uh, you know, all of a sudden a new um, uh, wearable device decides that it 
can produce blood pressure and um, they don't start by looking at the implementation guides for blood pressure in an observation and therefore slight variation happens. So um, <clears throat> I, I would like to give a real confident that, you know, fire is, is being deployed and it's everything is happy. Um, which by the way, the, the, the happy toolkit is, is a huge success, um, which is a fire-based um, uh, API toolkit. There, <clears throat> there is some um, use of, of uh, document sharing um, profile I've written in IHE, uh, MHD, um, as an API to an XDS environment or an XCA. Um, the, the, um, where it's being used, it's, it's doing pretty well. Um, however, anybody who is deploying something using Fire today really needs to include in their plan an expectation that things will change. Um, and if you're used to HL7 v2, you're used to the fact that things change. Over there, they change for a totally different reason. So you may have already intentionally, uh, you know, put into your plan a, a you know, a, a maintenance cycle, a, a revision, a, a break fix. Um, but I'm just, it's a caution. Um, it, it may, you know, not need it, but it might. And it's, it's best at this point to plan for unforeseen changes. Thanks, John. And we see that the US is uh, quite active on adoption of fire, right? So the recent rulings they are inclining towards uh, adoption of fire right for the api exchange standard yeah the us um there is is a, a contingent of of luminaries within the us that uh are focused solely on the use of fire um i tend to think that that is is too restrictive of a view, but in this core clinical data set, um, the, the vital signs and, and what is a patient, what is a, a practitioner, um, in those spaces, I think that's a mature enough fire specification that it's okay to start moving over to that. But um, this perspective has potentially held back uh, some successful interoperability that would have been based around XDS or CDA documents. Um, uh, while people said, oh, I've been told that FIRE is the solution and, and you were told that five years ago and we've wasted five years. Uh, that could have been you know, uh, a success uh, uh, with a transition to FIRE you know, in the next five years. Um, so I, I think their exuberance is is strong, and and it's well founded. Um, but it does have a a, a back uh, you know a, a bad side in that it can exuberance of something that isn't mature can stall progress. And there's cases where. Um, uh, organizations said, you know, hey, we've been told fire is the solution, we're gonna use fire, and they rolled out the uh, the DSTU version of fire. And, uh, you know, I think we're gonna be stuck with that version of fire in some production uh, for, you know, 10, 20 years, because they jumped really soon. And, um, you know, that is, is, you know, in hindsight going to be um, something that's expensive. Now, fortunately, the difference between DSTU2 
and the normative version of observation is small. So conversions, you know, can usually be done without uh, much problem, so, yeah. usually. So, so thanks, John. So what I understand is FHIR is still a draft standard and there can be breaking changes, use caution. Uh, but what I also see is like uh, FHIR has potential to be a successful standard for data exchange in future, right? And that's where the people are uh, betting on, right? Yeah, yeah that, that's, a, oh. that's a really good high level statement. Um, yeah. We'll point out that <laughs> there are some that, A question around that, John, mm -hmm. is, and this is coming from uh, technologists and people all around, right? Uh, people have spent years in healthcare IT and they have been building solutions and uh, building applications, right? Now this new standard fire comes in, right? The question is, does it ha offer them a, a benefit? I mean, so should people uh, go learn fire from a career perspective? Uh, would it help to learn fire in coming future if they want to pursue career in healthcare IT? So I think that's the last question. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, to your to your first point, um, for the most part, a lot of fire is still not normative. There is a a handful of parts of fire, patient observation, um, that are normative. There will not be breaking changes to those resources <clears throat> and, and the way that you access those resources. So with the release four of fire, there is, is some parts of fire which are, 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 are fixed. They're not gonna break. Um, and, and they tend to be the things that, that most medical data is, is, is centered around. But, you know, there's a huge amount of fire that is in this, this standard for trial use, which um, absolutely, if somebody comes along and says, hey, you know, this here doesn't meet this particular use case, and the committee says, oh, yeah, we do have to, we do have to make this breaking change, the committee is allowed to make breaking changes to, uh, to the non-normative parts of FHIR. And that breaking change could affect anybody who has deployed um, something based around the the trial use version of of the specification. Which, by the way, that that trial use uh, breakage uh, require uh, breakage allotment is also allowed over an IHE. Uh, it's only when you get to normative specification that IHE will also. Um, governance doesn't allow breaking changes. Um, as to the question of, of whether you should um, uh, train on, on learning the FHIR API or how to uh, connect, you know, FHIR-based um, you know, interfaces, 100%, absolutely. I, I wouldn't spend any time trying to learn um, HL7v2 even though HL7v2 will be used for 20 or 30 years henceforth. But for the most part, how it'll be used is exactly the way it's used today. In other words, no one is creating new features using HL7v2, but no one is going to turn off an existing interface that is using HL7v2. So if you're a new developer, I wouldn't at all spend any time on HL7v2. Let the, let the old guard <laughs> deal with that. Um, and, and honestly, you know, it, it's not that hard to pick up. Um, but learning uh, fire is, is, is pretty easy. The, one of the, the, the principles uh, of the core fire team when we started to work on, well, what is FHIR? Uh, we looked at the, uh, the, the existing tool set that um, new developers, uh, you know, come out of college uh, or tech school knowing how to use. And we based it around this RESTful interaction model, 
JSON or simple XML, uh, the concept of, of, of resources with create, read, update, delete, um, query parameters using HTTP. Um, we, we based it around a lot of the technologies that are, are very transferable to non-healthcare. So like I said, it's the same um, technology stack as, as Google and Facebook and Twitter and yada, yada, yada use. So it's 80% it's, it's that common understanding. And, and then you just have the, you know, the 20% uh, of, oh, that's what healthcare, uh, you know, wants me to, to, to treat a, a, a medical order or an observation or a task. Um, so it, it's just really understanding the, 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 the specifics for healthcare within that broader RESTful JSON uh, environment. Thanks, John. So uh, your your indication is there is uh, not much of a benefit in learning V2 to uh, V2 if you have not done it. Instead, get on to Fire, which is easy to learn and which has new applications and new things, uh, which will have an uptake for Fire. Right. Completely understood. Yeah. Yep. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, we are uh, completely all on time and. Uh, so uh, and the there is there are some polls and uh, if you can yeah go ahead with John with your uh, uh, references if you want yeah they, they're in the, the the slide deck um uh, yeah. and I'm happy to to provide them but um you were asking for IHE profiles on on fire and if you go to this page it it has categorized all of the IHE profiles that use fire oh this is great. I'm not exactly sure if I click on that, if it'll bring it up on that screen. Nope, it's going to bring it up on a different screen. Yeah. So this here is is all of the the profiles that IG has uh, 33 so far today, and I think there's actually some others that haven't been categorized right that that need to be added here. But um, that just happens to be that the, the set of profiles. Thanks, John. Uh, Aditya, uh, are you ready with the polls? Yeah, sure. Uh, so there are some polls. I mean, there's simply some questions we would like to ask the audiences uh, related to the upcoming event, HS India uh, Virtual Fire Connectathon. Uh, so I would like you guys to take the polls and I'm launching the poll right now, one question after another. You would look, uh, you will see the questions on your screen. Uh, please give your answers. Okay, I can see 75% of you have voted. Please, uh, rest of the audience, if you can please vote. Can we move to the next question, please? Sure. So I'm closing this. And let's move to the next one. I've launched the next question.
everyone please do vote okay uh, let's move to the next question then and thanks everyone for so giving this time giving your time to do the poll next question please sure Any more questions? Yes, a couple of more. Uh, just let me launch one more question. We are over the, okay, go ahead. Okay, launching the last question. That's, I promise it's last question. <laughs> Thanks everyone for your time. Thank you for the invite. Uh, thanks, Aditya. Thank you. Have a good day, uh, weekend. Yeah. Hi, John. So uh, thanks, everyone, uh, for attending the call. And uh, just to uh, a vote of thanks to John. And uh, I did reach out to John just uh, two days uh, in advance. And uh, it was like, uh, uh, it was just a pleasure talking to him and in just uh, like, three to five minutes john said yes right so he's a big supporter of uh, india and he is a big supporter of standardization uh, be it hl7 ihe and he has uh, like a long history of working with standards and making standards work and i happen to know john from uh, my john happened to be my ex colleague in uh, my previous company uh, that was ge so where we used to work together. 
thanks again john for accepting the invite and uh, helping the audience clarify a lot of questions today thank you You're glad to help thank you thanks a lot john yep bye bye, -bye.